All right, all right, all right. Welcome all right, back to all another. All right, all right. Go ahead. Just, just cut me off there. That's fine. This, this is off to a fantastic start. Now, welcome guys back to another episode of It's Mock Draft Season. Today we're going to be doing a robustification of the running back and tackling all things RB. But I am Derek, and this is my colorful co-host. I am the colorful co-host, Leo, uh, the favorite of the audience, probably. No evidence to support this, but I got to think it's true. It's got to be true. I'll give you that one because you don't have much else to, to lean on. That's true, very little. Real but yeah, this is going to be a great show, guys. It's not going to be no 7 and 9 podcast. It's not going to be no 8 and 8 podcast. That's uh, a reference to Hard Knocks, which you haven't seen, Leo, but... No. It's worth mentioning. No. It was that was Jeff Fisher, by the way, for all of you who have not seen Hard Knocks. There's a scene where he's trying to pump up his team by saying, you know, we're no seven and nine team. We're no eight and eight. No nine and seven. And then he just got carried away and kept on going <laughs> with it. And eventually I think he ends up by saying, We're no ten and six team. No no eleven and five. No, I don't What's wrong with those? That. Those are great records. <laughs> I know. I was like, damn, for for coming from seven and nine last year, shoot, Jeff. Yeah, throw yeah, a lot of shade at some solid ass records, Jeff. Come on, Jeffy. Yeah, Jeff. yeah Hard Knocks was an interesting watch. Uh, if you haven't heard of Hard Knocks, it's the HBO behind the scenes look at training camp. And this season, they are following around Los Angeles Rams. Uh, last year, they did the Texans, I believe. That was like the Texans are just the most boring team to watch in any situation. So that wasn't a super exciting season. Yeah, I mean, to be honest, the, the first episode wasn't that exciting. Mm. There, there were some interesting tidbits, like Tavon Austin playing Pokemon Go with some random child. Yeah. Nobody knows where the child came from, how old the child was, but he was just out, you know, playing Pokemon Go with him. Just some kid. And there's a scene where Jeff Fisher cuts uh, Nick Foles. They actually have the, the phone recording of that. And the conversation plays out something like this. Uh... Hey, Nick, you know, uh, how's your off-season going? How's your family? Did you get a chance to uh, travel? You're cut. Anyways, uh, <laughs> I just thought, you know, I just tried to slide it in. I was like, what? Did, uh, didn't quite catch what you said there. Yeah, what's that show on Fallon where they have, they, they have like a password or a secret word that they have to try to slide into a conversation? I forget what it's called, oh, but it's one of his Yeah, I don't bits. know. I don't know, actually. Yeah, but it, that's exactly how that phone call played out. He just tried to like slide it in <laughs> and then get out of that situation yeah, cool as fast i gotta as go uh, <laughs> oh man no case keenum's knocking at the door your replacement anyway <laughs> see you later nick <laughs> all right so it looks like we are 28 seconds away from the draft hopefully this robust fills up. rb still got yeah, five hopefully this computers here That's, oh, well, i guess we'll see and again a lot of this plays to the time difference mm. so it is what time is it over there 10 o'clock 9 30 9 30 yeah, on the West Coast, which means it's midnight 30 on the East Coast. Mm -hmm. So we're about to start here. Uh, we'll get more into what the robust running back strategy is as we draft. Uh, for me, since I'm drafting number one, the decision is pretty simple. We have Todd Gurley as our number one overall player, and he just happens to be a running back. So I'm going to go ahead and snatch him up right here. Bing! Toddy Gurley, wow. There it goes. Dang, Dang that computer so quick. <laughs> Itchy fingers. But yeah, Todd Gurley, it's a no-brainer for me. Oh, I think you probably would have selected Todd Gurley as well. Yeah, for sure. We have him as our number one running back. I think he's going to take a big step forward, even though the argument recently has been that he won't take a step forward for whatever reason. That I've been reading that in a lot of articles like, Oh, well, you think he's going to be healthy this year because he was coming off of the ACL surgery. But he was healthy last year, so he's not going to improve. I'm like, well, you do have to take into consideration that he missed all of the offseason workouts last year. Yeah. So just being on the field now will make a huge difference, especially for a second-year player. So, I mean, Todd Gurley's elite. I think he will be the best running back in the NFL for years to come mm -hmm. once we see Jamal and AP kind of fade away. Yeah. Le'Veon, maybe a little bit. Who knows what's going to happen with Le'Veon? I mean, he could go the Josh Gordon route. It's uh, not impossible. I won't say too much. You're coming up on your pick. So. Well, came up lightning quick. So to refresh for people that don't know, Robust RB is the exact opposite of Zero RB, where you now take five running backs in a row, uh, seemingly regardless of value. It's kind of silly. Uh, but it's not hard for me to make that choice here because uh, I was gifted one Lamar Miller. 
and one uh, Jamal about that base Charles, which if you're sitting here at the turn, I'd take that even if this wasn't robust RB. That's like that's the ideal 12-13 turn yeah. for me uh, in any format, honestly. Honestly. Uh, so yeah, that's a fantastic turn, actually. The computer how really that played that out to me. Jesus. Well, Zeke and David Johnson going five and six helped you out there a little that's bit, too. That's true, yeah. That's, that's like, I, I hate that they go in the first in like the grand scheme of fantasy football, but for me personally, I love it because that means the guys that are actually worth that spot slide later. Yeah. We'll see how things play out after preseason. We'll see ADPs, average mm-hmm. draft position, kind of shoot all over the place. Like LaShawn McCoy, for example, his ADP has been steadily rising. He used to be, or at least a couple of weeks ago, he was pretty much set in the third round, but now we've seen him climb higher and higher up into the second round. So who knows where he'll be come actual draft day. Okay, so let's see who's still on the board here. We have Eddie Lacy. No, nope, he just went. Mark Ingram, Tommy Rawls. You see me, Rawls, and... Yep. <laughs> CJ Anderson, Matt Forte, Tay Trey Murray, Carlos Hyde. Actually, this has been pretty running back heavy in the second round. We saw four yeah. running backs go in a row there. This is kind of surprising. Now, I mean, you mentioned that robust running back is five running backs regardless of value. So we're going to try to stick to that as closely as possible. It might be something like four running backs in a row mm-hmm. um, because the tiers will drastically drop off after the first three rounds So to where if you were actually drafting, it would be foolish in my opinion to continue to draft running backs when the yeah. value says otherwise but i'm going to take mark ingram here i probably would have made this pick regardless of what draft strategy i was implementing i think he has a solid floor this season and could potentially bring you a high ceiling as well because he does get involved in the passing game so Gurley and ingram one and two and now it gets a little bit iffy let's see here thomas rawls are I think I'm going to have to go with Rawls just for the upside yeah, I like and that. for the offense that he plays in. I mean, C.J. Anderson has question marks all over. Matt Forte could be in a split backfield with blah, 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 Powell. <laughs> Latavius Murray I like, but not this high. So I'm going to go ahead and take Thomas Rawls. He's off the PUP list, training camp. They're kind of easing him back into action, but I think he will be the man there. There were some mm-hmm. question marks like, oh, ProSize is going to come steal the job, but... Camp talk has been that ProSize has missed so much time that he's kind of fallen behind a little bit. So maybe it's Christine Michael that is oh. second in line I mean, in the Seattle. ProSize needed a perfect storm of Rawls needing like until week one to get healthy and him having the perfect training camp to really carve out any kind of early down roll. But Rawls is healthy off the pup. ProSize is out still. Uh, and Christine Michael, I just, I don't, I will never believe in. For any reason at all, uh, Alex Collins is just one of the unwashed masses, as far as I'm concerned at this point. So I think it's like it's Rawls's job. If he like performs like he should, like he did last year, he will be the guy. So he's like I think he's really good value in the third, actually. Um, yeah. Oh, here you are. Come to my pick, uh, where I am going to continue with running backs. I mean that is a strategy, but I see guys I like anyway. Uh, the ones that jump out to me are uh, Tay Train Murray. Uh, I'm very try. high on him this year. I think he has, yeah. you know, top five running back in his range of outcomes, and I think his floor is pretty safe. The, like, fantasy number machine wanted you to believe that DeAndre Washington was going to steal the job, but there's been no report of anything like that even faintly happening. Um, it's Tate Train's job, unless he, like, gets hurt, basically. So, very happy to lock him in as my third running back. Uh, and as we sit here... And I'm looking at the guys that yeah. are left. Uh, it gets dicey. It gets a little dicey. Um, it's kind of the end of the tier. It's the end of the tier, yeah. Part of me wants to reach for J. Stu, just reach way down because he's like he's my guy I love. But I think I am actually might take uh, Matt Forte. Um, okay. On the, or maybe Carlos side. Um, between those two, Matt Forte has, you know, if he is can stay healthy, he will be, you know, the guy in that offense that's been productive. Yeah, no, I've talked myself into it. Matt Forte in the fourth <laughs> round. I like it. Uh, he's been going in the third round, which I don't like as much there, but as a fourth running back, like it's yeah, it's all upside at that point. If he gets hurt, it doesn't really have a problem for me. And if he can stay healthy, then, you know, he'll, he could put up 
RB1 numbers again. He was doing it last year until he got hurt, yeah, and he now was. he is fully healthy. So I don't really believe that he's like hit a brick wall. It's just that it could happen because of his age. Yeah, I think people are a little bit scared of Matt Forte because of how similar his contract is to Bilal Powell and the fact that Bilal Powell was heavily involved at the end of last year. Mm -hmm. So the assumption is that it's going to be a, almost a split backfield, but I, who knows how that will really play out, and he's still Matt Forte. He was still putting up elite numbers last year, so I mean, we'll have to, to wait and see, but in the fourth round, you're talking about getting Matt Forte in the fourth round, that's, that's good value there. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. There was a, a huge run on wide receiver in the third round. So when it comes back to me, C.J. Anderson, he has to go. There t have been two guys, both computers, mind you, <laughs> that have started out triple wide receiver. So I don't see how there's any possible way. Okay, yeah, there he goes. Jeremy Hill just went, who was another target of mine. Deion Lewis is interesting here if he makes it to me, but nah, nope. And Jeremy Langford is off the board. Wow. So that leaves me with... Your man, Jay Stu, one, Matt Jones. Matt Jones. Two, Matt Jones. Ryan Matthews. So, whew, well, I might just go full into this robust RB strategy and go five running backs to start just to see what my team will look like because mm -hmm. that's why we're making this pod so you guys can look at our draft board and say, oh, my God, that's what your team looks like when you start out five RBs. So I'm going to take... Matt Jones, again, at the turn, it doesn't really matter which order I take these players. They're essentially lumped into the same category here. Now, do I just buy into this Arian Foster hype and take Arian Foster? No, that's not going to happen. <laughs> I'm going to take Jonathan Stewart here. Yeah, there you go. You're going to be very happy with that pick when he's an RB1. The top of the fifth? Yeah, I think so. Carolina, they have a inviting schedule for the running back. Uh, Jonathan Stewart, as long as he stays healthy, should be in the running back one conversation. And he's been a player that hasn't really seen any love <laughs> in ADP, even mm -hmm. though he had a fantastic year last year. I mean, you've tweeted out his stats oh, from yes. like after, post bye oh, week yes. last year. He, he had fantastic <laughs> numbers. So yeah. to get him in the fifth, to get a starting running back in the fifth round, that's what you're looking for in any sort of situation, yeah. re regardless of it's zero running back or robust. I'm with you. Uh, I was hoping Melvin would make it to me, and he didn't. And uh, the upside of Foster went right before me, which is fine, because I probably wouldn't have done it. Uh, so as I sit here, eyeing a running back and a wide receiver, I still like Ryan Matthews at the end of the fifth. I don't, I don't hate that pick. Yeah, um, his ADP's come way down since... Yeah camp reports have said that he is already injured yeah i'm not worried about that just yet and as my fifth running back it's just like a pure upside pick you know so yeah. why not lock in the ryan matthews and now i start scrambling for wide receivers yeah this is where it gets uh, interesting of the guys left who do i trust the most is my wide receiver one who do i think is i guess probably the safest is the way i want to go yeah um and it's either josh gordon <laughs> nope <laughs> See, like Moncrief uh, Matthews but didn't he get hurt in camp so that's like a little scary he uh, did It's not, it shouldn't be serious but you never know it's some sort of knee yeah. tweak you know fantasy the fantasy community loves Moncrief but I think I might lock in Matthews just because he's going to get so many targets uh, I like that yeah it's just like he, yeah. he doesn't have quite the upside but there's going to be plenty of upside receivers later and he just like has such a high floor with how many targets he gets I think I want to go that way with my first wide receiver. Yeah, so are you of the mind that since you started out five running backs that you want to lock in safer picks for your wide receivers to start and then hit on the high upside later in the draft? Yeah, that's kind of the way I'm looking at it because there's so many upside wide receivers when to hit around like seven or eight. Like it very quickly just turns into all upside guys. So I'd, yeah. I'd rather grab one of the last few like seemingly high floor guys, even if the ceiling isn't as high, just to know that I have something I can start. Exactly. Okay, so let's see here. Obviously, I've drafted my five running backs. The next pick has to be a wide receiver. I'm looking at Emmanuel Sanders, John Brown, Tyler Lockett, Devontae Parker. Oh, let's see. I think for my first pick, I'm going to take John Brown at the back end of the sixth. 
I think that's fantastic value for yeah. who we believe will be the best wide receiver on the Arizona team. Now, of course, the argument can be made that, oh, well, bench stash. There's a lot of mouths to feed on, <laughs> on the Arizona Cardinals football team. And yes, there are, but I think John Brown is legitimately the only wide receiver that still has room to improve. Mm -hmm. We've seen Michael Floyd for a couple years. We've seen Larry Fitzgerald for a century. So John Brown is the pick. Now, it, I seem to be trending towards these upside players, so I think I'm going to go a little bit in a different direction here and go upside uh -huh. with my wide receivers to start. So I'm going to take your boy. No, my boy, Ty Ty. Oh, the, the tile, tile driver. driver. Oh, my the Top God. of the seventh. I was hoping he'd make it, it back to me, but I guess that's a pipe dream. Yeah. Yeah, that's not going to happen. I'm just going to ruin your <laughs> dreams, I guess crush so. your soul. Steal you're, candy from you. Your your lineup is looking like guys that I all love. The the Rawls, the Stewart, the Lockett, the Ingram. This is basically my team that you're drafting, and I'm I can't I'm like yeah. happy about it, but I'm also furious. <laughs> you are my influence, Khaleesi. I guess so. Yeah, I like that Brown Lockett combination. Like it's pretty boomer bust, but if they can both carve out real roles, then like that's like a super super lethal combo. Yeah, and I don't think those guys make it back to me. So that's yeah. part of my thinking. Mm -hmm. pattern here. John Brown, Tyler Lockett, they are the high upside guys. They are the guys that could make or break any given week. So the way I'm going to play this draft, I started off with five running backs. So my running back slot should be completely solidified. So now I'm going to try to hit on these high upside wide receivers in the middle of the draft. Mm -hmm. And then I have my eye on some safer, kind of undervalued wide receivers that I will probably take a look at in the ninth, 10th, 11th rounds. All right, back are. to you. We made it back to me. Time to just feverishly paw at more wide receivers. Um, again, yeah, this is all upside guys. Uh, I'm going to tell you right now, one of these guys is going to be Marvin Jones because um, I don't think he makes it back to me at the end of the ninth. Like, he wouldn't make it past you, I don't think. Um, no, definitely not. So then and he is the number one wide receiver in Detroit. The number one if, wide if, receiver if read in the, the news. NFL if you've read a tweet ever. <laughs> <laughs> um, so definitely Marvin Jones and then either Parker or I think Kevin White, like Sterling Shepard is interesting, but it's just like, I'm not, I haven't like heard or seen anything tangible to believe he's like, it's, it's too early to, for that for me. Uh, oh, have you read Twitter? Marvin Jones real quick. I have, I have Marvin read Jones Twitter thing. and they love, Come on. and they love, uh, they love Sterling Shepard, but, uh, I'm not ready to do that yet. So of Devonte Parker and Kevin White, they're both kind of, kind of the, the same thing. Hmm. Hmm. I gotta go white. Yeah, I think gotta I gotta go it. white. Yeah, it's he's the the raw of the two, and he's basically Definitely. entering his rookie season. But it's I like his quarterback more and his situation more, um, and yeah, talent raw talent more. I think uh, yeah. just go for it, man. Kevin White, boom. If he works out, then uh, that's a steal, and that helps me quite a bit. I mean, basically what you're thinking is that you have Jay Cutler as the number one quarterback in the NFL and Ryan Tannehill as the number two. <laughs> That's basically so, what we're saying. Yeah, yeah, okay. So basically Kevin White has the better of the two quarterbacks. So yeah. you go Kevin White there. Yeah, yeah. That's exactly. With uh, RG3 coming in at a close number three. Yeah, those are just stellar QB <laughs> rankings. Yeah. And we will release a top 200 for you guys in the next mm -hmm. week or two. Yeah. So we are working on that right now. We had our top 50 like really, really early, yeah. and there have already been drastic changes. I mean, this was before Lev Bell got suspended, mm -hmm. before Jordy had his hiccup, before any of this camp wish wash. Oh, God. Oh, come on, Deshaun. Yes. Ooh, okay. there it is. D-Jax. I like that. D-Jax in the back of the eighth. I don't know how this is happening. I think recency bias plays a role into it because mm -hmm. he was hurt for the majority of last season but the guy has basically been an automatic wide receiver too when he's been on the field yeah i made a little video about deshaun jackson saying that he's really only been injured in a couple of the seasons he's played throughout his career one of them was last season and the other was in 2012 when he missed five games but other than that he's he seems to be around the 13 14 15 game mark consistently mm -hmm. so i'm going to take d jacks here in the eighth Kind of just bled the clock a little bit to give me some more time for this <laughs> next pick. So now I have these three high upside wide receivers in a row. John Brown, Tyler Lockett, Deshaun Jackson. They all can stretch the field. They're all deep threats. So I'm going to take a little bit of a safer pick. Oh, man. 
You see, here's the problem. I love Crab. Yeah. But I also love Stefan Diggs. Ooh, this no year. diggity. No diggity, no doubt. I think he's been undervalued. But when I compare the two teams, Minnesota and Oakland, Minnesota. I think the op <laughs> Minnesota A. Eh? <laughs> I think the opportunity will be higher for Crab. So I'm gonna take Crab at the start of the ninth. Yeah. I think he will see more red zone opportunities, probably more volume. That's always been the knock on Diggs, even though I love his talent. And word out of camp is that he's been far and away the best wide receiver in Minnesota. So all this Treadwell mm-hmm. nonsense, Treadwell might not even see the field. And there Diggs goes. So <laughs> Yeah, no way he's going to make it back to you. That's, that's insane to what think about. What all these defenses going in the ninth round for? Are these computer picks? Two of them are. Yes. One of yes, them was okay. a real person somehow. Uh, so as we sit here, back to me, I still need more wide receivers. I'm still not confident in my, my group, my group of guys. Um, this is where I think I'm ready to take Corey Coleman. Um, I don't believe in Josh Gordon being able to stay sober for four games and then after that an entire season. And then, like, what is he even really? Like, it's been three years since he's been elite. Like, I just, it's too, no, Corey Coleman. Like, that. I don't, I think, I think I'm happy that Gordon came back because it's pushed Coleman's ADP down. I think ninth round is a, a good place to get him. Yeah, the end of the ninth too. That's yeah. that's value right there. And then um, I, even though I like some of the quarterbacks left still, uh, I'm just gonna hammer on wide receiver one more time because uh, my boy Tory Smith is still here. And, oh wow, yeah. And in the ten- beginning of the tenth round, I think that's a great value because it's our people are acting like that 49ers offense is gonna be literally incapable of moving the ball, which just is is not the case. There will be a lot of targets to go around. And the only other guy there is Bruce Ellington, who I don't nothing about him suggests he is better than Torrey Smith to me. So Torrey Smith is going to get a lot of targets. Well, I disagree. I think everything about Bruce Ellington says that he will be better than <laughs> Torrey Smith. He, he's legitimately a fantasy sleeper, though. He could yeah. he's a slot receiver right now. He could rack up a lot of catches, uh, and he's basically free. So we'll see how that changes. I as do like him a lot as a sleeper, but I don't see yeah. him as like a the de facto number one that soaks up all the targets. He's not like a Julio or an Antonio where the second guy there loses a lot of value. Okay, let's see. So 10th pick, I'm going to start looking at quarterbacks. Okay, there's still some quarterbacks that I like. Tight ends, um, barnyard dog. No, that's not going to happen. Wide receivers, it's getting thin now. Now we're getting to the real like high upside kind of crapshoot picks here. But my clock is running out. Who's still left in the running back field? I might go all in on this. Kenneth Dixon, Devontae Booker. Clock is dwindling. I'm going to make a pick that you're going to love. Oh, okay, that wasn't my pick. <laughs> no, you didn't I, mean clock, to take Jimmy Graham. The clock ran out on me, but I, <laughs> I ended up with Jimmy Graham. Okay. Uh, <laughs> wow, why is, he, okay. why is his ADP at the end of the 10th? That doesn't sure, make any I sense. Know. I don't know what happened there. Okay. So, But, you know, that was totally my intention. Okay. That's exactly what I wanted to draft. Sure. He just came off the PUP. He's back on the practice <laughs> off field. The puppy. He's going to be the greatest tight end of all time once his career is said and done. Well, now that I have my tight end, I guess I'm going to go and get my quarterback. So <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and grab Kirky Cousins. Oh, God. Is that Finally. who you were trying to take before? That is who I was trying to take before. So now God. I basically just end up with a wasted pick on my tight end. But that's all right. Turn I don't know entirely. God. Kirk but Cousins. Kirk Cousins, I've, this is the first opportunity I've had to draft him in a mock. And I'm just going to let you taste the tears God, that's, that's that are running horrible. down your cheeks right now. Okay, go ahead and take what the pick. I got left? I still like uh, Dwayne Allen. The Ebron injury hasn't scared me because he's fine. Um, yeah. And I'm probably in the range where if I don't take one of them, I won't get them at the next time around. QB, who we got? Who we got? Who do you know? Tyrod's gone. That makes me very, very sad. In fact, we're at that point where none of these guys are worth an 11th round pick to me. So I'm not going to take quarterback. I'm just going to wait even longer. Um, Good, yeah. 13th round? Sure. Yeah, why not? We'll see who's there. We'll see, man. We'll see what happens. But I am going to lock in uh, Dwayne Allen. Yeah, I like that. And now uh, let's look more at running back. Wide receiver, who do we got that jumps? Uh, Honey Funch is a vote. He's an interesting guy to me. <laughs> um, <laughs> he's, you know, they're going to sling that pigskin around around a bunch. But actually, there's been 
reports that he's much improved. He looked better down the stretch last year. Um, I'm not like I might not take another running back the rest of this draft. Honestly, um, I'm yeah. more concerned about the wide receiver depth and Funches. I think that the upside is there. If that offense can be even like 80 percent of what it was last year, he could uh, he could be worth it as a a sixth wide receiver in the twelfth round. Yeah. Exactly. He's basically going to be the Calvin Benjamin of two years ago. That's 100% what's going to happen. Yeah. And drop 50% of the balls that are thrown to him. Yes. <laughs> the other 50% will go for negative gains. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So my the Jimmy Graham fiasco has kind of <laughs> kind has of, kind of set my draft back a little bit, but yeah. I'm going to have to take another tight end. I'm, I don't you can't just go all in on Jimmy, Jimmy Graham. Graham. No. That wasn't supposed to happen. Or was it? No, that wasn't supposed to happen. We'll see. Um, let's see who we have back into the wide receiver column here. I'm going to go ahead and take somebody who's basically an injury away from being a top two wide receiver on supposedly, allegedly, an elite passing offense. Headed by one Andrew Luck and going to nab a Philip Dorsett at the end of the 12th. I like it. I like it. High upside there. And now I have to look at a tight end because really, I mean, come on. So Antonio Gates is a clear pick here. Yeah. I mean, he's eight touchdowns away from basically shattering all NFL records combined. Not just one, but every single one of the NFL records. He will break. So Philip Rivers is going to try to get him that tight end record, touchdown record. So we'll see. And I think at the 13th round, you can't really. I mean, I don't know how Gates is still lasting to the 13th round. I think it's because of uh, ageism. Yeah, it actually probably is ageism. It's like, oh, he's old. He can't play anymore. But he, he still can. He can't, like, run anymore. But he can still catch touchdowns. And he still. Yeah, you don't need to run to safe. stand in the end zone. <laughs> no, you don't need to run to be able to run stand, a fucking yeah, button catch hook. the ball. All right, now I desperately need to take a quarterback. Um, but uh, I was hoping to see Ryan right before me. I would have taken Matt Ryan here and been pretty happy about it. Yeah. Um, but I'm in this Oof, situation. You're, le- you're left so, with some slim pickings here. I See, in this situation, this is where it's like, okay, I'm going to stream. Who do I like as a streamer the most out of these guys? And uh, yeah. I think it's probably F- Ryan Fitzy. Um, yeah, I think he's probably the safest streamer of the bunch left that still has some upside, you know, that isn't Alex Smith. Um, so I'll lock in Fitzpatrick. I don't even know who he's playing. Week one doesn't matter. He's going to throw six touchdowns. Um, and then, oh, I guess i got to take a defense. Oh, this is 15 rounds. All right. Uh, Jets defense. Perfect. Let's just pair those up. Boom. Lock Do you have in. to take a defense? You don't have to take a defense. Uh, I mean, I guess not, but I'd rather build, like, a a realistic roster. Of what it would look oh. like. You can do whatever you want, though. I don't care. I'm going to take Mariota. <laughs> there it is. Just go double up on the tight end, double up on the quarterback. Boom. Now, normally, I wouldn't take more than one quarterback or one tight end. But, you know, I'm not, I'm not too upset about this Jimmy Graham pick now. The more oh, that I yeah. think about it, I mean, he has elite talent. He elite. did. He did Capital have elite e. talent. No, he still has it. It's still in there somewhere. Just, can he access it now? Just has to unleash it. He has to evolve into a better version of himself. Has to evolve past his now shattered patellar tendon. Or was that the injury? Patellar tendon? Yeah. Yeah, that's that's going to go well for him. Uh, speaking of evolution, Pokemon Go is out in Singapore. Did it Official. just come out in Singapore? Finally. Just came out. God, yeah. you live in the dirt, basically. But now I, f- I have a legitimate excuse to walk around yelling at my phone, even though I'm really looking at fantasy news and being like, <laughs> no, Edelman is hurt. What? <laughs> and people will just assume that I'm playing Pokemon Go. They're like, oh, man, the Snorlax just got away from him. <laughs> I guess I will make a legitimate roster here. So, I mean, kicker and defense at the turn here to close out the draft. I'm just going to go with Venetary for my kicker. Because they should be seeing a lot of scoring opportunities. And defense, I mean, I always stream defenses, so it really just comes down to who has the best week one matchup. Jacksonville, Philly, Buffalo, New England. I'm just going to go ahead and take the Patriots. There you go. Take the Patriots in the 15th round. Now, with my kicker and my defense, 
there's no way I end the season with Vinatieri in New England on my team. I've always been a streamer in those two positions. And actually, with the tight end, sometimes I will go streamer as well. Oh, man, now comes the most important pick of my draft, the kicker. This is it. Uh, Josh Brown's a name I recognize. Chris Boswell's a name I don't recognize. Same with uh, Robert Aguayo. Uh, so I think I'm going to go with a name I've heard before, Josh Brown. No, that's a – gosh. you got to go Aguayo. Aguayo? He was taken in the second round this year by Tampa Bay. Was he? Yeah. Was, that, was he that pick? He was that pick. Oh God, no. That's I the man right there. I refuse to support such a decision. You have to do it now. Woo! We did it. The draft is complete. We um, did it. The robustification has been robustified. So robust. So how do you feel about your robust RB team? I haven't even looked at my roster yet. I was just drafting, basically. <laughs> Completely blacked out. Let's see. Todd Gurley, Mark Ingram, Thomas Rawls, Matt, Matt Jones, Jonathan Stewart. Yeah, I love my running backs, let's be honest. Uh, Todd Gurley and Mark Ingram, that's as solid as a 1-2 as you'll probably realistically get if you're starting off running back, running back. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can look at some of the other teams that drafted running back, running back. Yours included, Lamar Miller, Jamal Charles. That's fantastic. David Johnson, Doug Martin. I like Dougie. Don't know about DJ yet. Yeah. Zeke, Eddie. Again, the same situation. Uh, and even more question marks on the David and uh, Doug combination there. So I like my top two running backs. Then we get into Rawls. They see me, Rawls, and mm. Matt Jones, Jonathan Stewart, and they are de facto number one running backs on their team. Obviously, Rawls is at the top of that list. He has a fantastic situation, fantastic opportunity. Seattle has a charm and soft schedule when it comes to the running back. Matt Jones is probably the pick I'm most unsure about just because his efficiency was terrible last year. He just wasn't that good, but he has the potential, and he there's basically nobody behind him. Keith Marshall has been receiving some rave reviews, but I think as of now, he is the clear lead back in Washington. We'll see if that changes. Now, this is where it gets interesting with the robust running back draft strategy. Okay, you should have a solid group of running backs. That's what the strategy states. Then you get into your wide receivers starting in the sixth round. Now, I ended up with five wide receivers on my roster. John Brown, Tyler Lockett, Deshaun Jackson, Michael Crabtree, Philip Dorsett. Overall, I think that's not a bad group, to be honest with you. John Brown has a lot of upside. Tyler Lockett has a lot of upside. Deshaun Jackson is criminally undervalued. Michael Crabtree is the safe wide receiver that will see the volume that will put up a decent floor each and every week, that will be maybe matchup-based but startable throughout the majority of the season. And Philip Dorsett is an extremely high upside play. So with the safe base of running backs, you kind of need to shoot for the moon a little bit with your wide receivers. So it needs to be a mix of, okay, guys I feel comfortable starting and guys that could ascend into a top wide receiver. Because if you hit on one of these guys and you already have elite running backs, then you're cooking, basically. And if you hit on more than one of them, you probably have a championship caliber team. And for me, John Brown, Tyler Lockett are these guys that can make that ascension into wide receiver one territory. Not the wide receiver one, but wide receiver one territory. Yep. Uh, now, Jimmy Graham, that would not... That would not have happened in That's a That's a perfect draft. pick on your team. That's the best pick right I, there. I think sometimes I just like hearing my voice a little bit too much, and I was talking, <laughs> and I was kind of playing this up. I was, I was trying to set the scene for the Kirk Cousins God. pick, and then time ran out on me, and I ended up with Jimmy Graham. So that's what I get for liking Kirk Cousins, apparently. This is an omen of what Kirk Cousins will do to your season if you draft him. Just like my it opinion torpedoed of Kirk Cousins Derek's completely... draft. It's going <laughs> to torpedo your team if you draft Kirk Cousins. Don't do it. Don't do yeah, it is what I'm, we've learned. I'm off, I'm off the Kirk Cousins train. I'm done. Because <laughs> of this that, draft, I'm, I'm, out, I'm out. And Antonio Gates, I like. I love in the 13th round. Defense kicker, irrelevant. But overall, I'd, I'd say I'm satisfied, to be honest. I like this draft much more than I liked my zero RB draft. Mm. And to you. And to so. me. Uh, let me go over. We'll check out my team here. I changed the... I don't like this layout change they did. It's not looking quite as smooth on the on the capture. They put like the the draft in the middle of the window instead of like on the left, so it's a little bit harder for me to like zoom in on our teams. 
so I can't really zoom in on mine. So don't be I, nitpicky. Just, I'm gonna just talk I'm about gonna your team. Nitpick him, nitpick so hard. All right, uh, Lamar Miller and Jamal Charles at the turn. I would do that regardless of any strategy, regardless of not 100 percent regardless of format, but pretty much like in PPR, I would still do that. Um, so I'm very happy with that start. It's you know Lamar Miller has a high floor and the top three ceiling. Uh, Jamal Charles definitely has the top three, top one ceiling. It's just his floor is a little scary because we don't know how healthy he's going to be after his second torn ACL of his career. Uh, his eighth torn ACL. His, his, his 30th <laughs> torn ACL, I think, is the count. Uh, but if he comes back and he's healthy, then, like, that's a steal. That, like, that, those two right yeah. there already, like, give me a huge advantage. Like, your, your combo of Gurley and Ingram is safer uh, but I think my combo probably has the higher upside just because Ingram's upside is kind of capped as like he'll, he might finish as the fifth best running back, but he's not going to finish as the, the best running yeah. back. No, I actually like your two picks better than mm-hmm. mine because you had the turn at the end of the first, which just goes to show that, you know, at the end of the first round at the turn, there is a lot of value there yeah. depending regardless of draft strategy. So you have two higher upside running backs and Miller and Charles, whereas I have one running back that I love and Ingram that I like. Right. Uh, when we come back to me and then I have a Tay train, very happy about, think he's going to be an RB1 this year. I think his floor is like 12th best running back. I think it's just, unless he gets hurt, I think it's that safe um, and very high upside. Forte is, you know, the, the riskier guy, but at that point it's a little bit safer or at least is a little bit more okay to do because he's my fourth guy. And then Ryan Matthews in the fifth. Uh, as a core of five running backs, that's like, you know, that's great. Realistically, I wouldn't have done this if I wasn't being like pigeonholed into doing robust RB. I probably would have started Charles, Miller, and Tay Train. That would have gone that way yeah. regardless. But then I probably wouldn't have taken fourth. I probably would have taken like uh, looking at the receivers that were ahead of this. Macklin, uh, Edelman. Baldwin I would have taken any of those people Decker maybe probably not Decker but you know Macklin is a really safe wide receiver um two that has like that wide receiver he's probably like 12 wide receiver 12 to 15 is probably like what his like floor is realistically Macklin's very safe yeah uh, and Baldwin like I if you believe that offense is going to be not what it was at the end of last year because that's unsustainable but if it's going to be as efficient as it was then Baldwin has a lot of value so I probably would have taken one of those other guys instead and then not probably wouldn't have taken Ryan Matthews either. I probably coming back the other way would have taken probably still Jordan Matthews, but then also, you know, Moncree for taking like John Brown or something like that. So it's, I, I like this group of five, but I, there's no way I would have done this if it was in my own control. Um, shoulda, coulda, woulda. Shoulda, coulda, woulda. Yeah. And then looking at the Just... group of wide receivers, um, you know, Jordan Matthews, high floor, Marvin Jones, high ceiling, Kevin White, high ceiling. It's kind of like I got my one high floor guy, then a bunch of ceiling guys, and you just kind of hope one of them hits. Like I, I basically, when I drafted Jordan Matthews, I was drafting my wide receiver two, and then all the other guys is like, I hope one of these guys can turn into my wide receiver one, was basically what happened. Um, well, you have Marvin Jones, who will be the wide receiver one. will be the one. wide receiver one, so actually this is incredibly safe. <laughs> yeah. um, but that's kind of what happens in any draft, you're always like, I have all these spots filled and here's like the one problem spot. And usually that's your flex. And you're yep. like, who's gonna be my flex? And basically what this like zero RB and robust RB do is it's like a race to fill the flex where you're almost like my flex is set, that's not a problem. And like the RB two or wide receiver two, whatever it is on the opposite side, that's filled. And then you're basically just trying to fill that one extra spot. Like for me, it's like finding that guy that could turn into a wide receiver one. And if one of these guys can, then I'm safe. I'm very like I'm set, Um, and they all you know all these guys have a path to get there that isn't unrealistic. Um, And then Dwayne Allen, you know that's just kind of a high upside tight end pick. If it works out great, if not, then I just drop him. Not really a big deal in the eleventh round. Then Fitz is basically my saying I'm going to stream, and I (laughs) I trust him. You know, as at least like a safe streamer. It's possible that this was a real league. I'd even drop him before week one. And find no. someone with a better match. You have to keep him on your team just for the beard. Just, just for the beard. He shaved, he he shaved gets his rid head, of the beard. right? But he kept yeah. the beard. Yeah. He, he has the beard, which is key. Because if he shaves key, the beard, yeah. then you drop him automatically. Yeah. All uh, of his fantasy value is tied into his beard. <laughs> that's that's very true. That's uh, there's no yeah. way to dispute that. Um, I mean, yeah, fits through kicker defense. That's all just like streaming, basically. So that's basically what can be fine to ignore. Uh, yeah, I'm with you that I prefer robust RB. 
to zero RB, but so for my experiences, it's unlikely I go out of my way to do either. It's possible a draft plays out in such a way where I just like, I can't pass it up. Like let's say if at my four or five turn, um, who would have had to have fallen there? I don't know. A four or five turn? Like let's say I had taken Taytree and I'm coming back around. And let's say like, uh, let's say Rawls somehow made it to the beginning of the fourth. Then I'd be like, okay, I got to take Tay Train and Rawls. I can't pass that up. And then yeah. it comes back around and gets to the beginning of the fifth and Jonathan Stewart is still there. And it's like, okay, well, I have to take that. Like there is a version of this where on my own, I end up with five running backs. And that's when it becomes useful to learn these strategies because if you don't know how the strategy works, you don't know which wide receivers you should be targeting if you end up in that situation. You know, it's learning zero RB and learning robust RB isn't about you learn the strategy, you win your league. It's about learn the strategy. So if value dictates you doing it, you know which players to target in your mid to late rounds to make it work. That's really kind of like how it should be seen, not as like, this is the strategy. You go in, you do it at any slot, you do it no matter who's coming up in the in the pipe, and you just, you're going to win. Like, I don't, no, I think that's nonsense. Yeah. But it's yeah, and we talked about that in our draft strategies pod too, mm-hmm. that you can't go into the draft so fixated on one strategy yeah. to where you won't budge no matter what the value says. Yeah. You just stay within that draft strategy and draft at that position regardless of what is around you, what is left on the board. Mm -hmm. And that's just being closed-minded in terms of the draft. You have to allow the draft to kind of fall into your lap. And that's been a cliche, but really, I mean, draft the best player at the best position. Yeah. That's yeah, it's, it's basically it. It's draft best player available, or it's like I'll quote uh, Chris Harris. I listen to his podcast, which is fantastic. Um, it, which I said this in our Twitter timeline too. But it's draft players, not positions. Like it's it's about who the specific player is. It's not about well, should you go running back or wide receiver? It's like well, tell me who the players are, and then I can answer that question. Um, yeah. And so yeah, it's, which is like you don't see that get pumped as much on Twitter because it's a little bit boring and dated and there's no like hypey catchy name for it like zero rb or robust rb like there isn't anything like that for it so it kind of gets overlooked um but i think so far that is still where i'm at um we'll see if my opinion gets swayed over the next few weeks of mock drafts who knows who knows yeah you know i mean the whole zero running back i think what made it such a big thing was that Taking running backs early was always the status quo in fantasy football. And whenever you can find a value, that's what you're looking for. Whenever something, whenever a top tier player falls into your lap, that's the goal with the fantasy football draft. So in the past, it had been that wide receivers were the value because everyone was taking running back early. And then with the RB apocalypse and all these injuries and fragile comments about the running back position, it's kind of scared people away from drafting running backs. And this is the first year where we've really seen the zero running back come into play in such a full force. And almost every article you'll be reading about is talking about how zero running back is a way to go. And I think what that is going to do, it doesn't necessarily show in this mock draft, but there were computers involved and it's, it's not really the standard first round, at least from our experience. But what this whole zero RB spiel is going to do is it's going to change the paradigm of where the value lies. So it goes back to zigging when other people are zagging. I mean, if everybody is taking a wide receiver, then that means you are left with a top tier running back Mm -hmm. in the middle of the first round. And that is the goal. Just like if the situation was reversed, and you know, we're talking about four or five years ago where the first five, six picks were running backs. Then if you're sitting in the seventh, eighth pick, you have the best wide receiver on the board. Mm -hmm. And that is where the value lies. But I think because zero RB is being so highly touted this year that the value will lie in the running back position. Now, robust RB might be a little bit overboard. Like you said, there's a situation where Mm -hmm. starting out RB times five could happen, but it's very, very unlikely. So you can't be pigeonholed into this mental line of thought where you're saying okay I have to take a running back I mean I ha- I mean Mike Evans Alshon Jeffrey Jordy Nelson are still there but I mean I have to take a running back mm-hmm. if you're in that position or you've already drafted three I mean look at my team for example 
Gurley, Ingram, Rawls. I'm perfectly happy going triple running back, but look at who I could have drafted at the fourth spot at that turn right there, the 3-4 turn. I took Rawls, and then because we were doing robust running back, I took Jones. But I could have taken, like you said, there are a number of guys on the board that I could have taken there. I could have taken, I mean, Macklin, Baldwin, Landry, Decker, Tate, Edelman. I mean, there's a number of players that I could have taken that I would have been happy with as a uh, wide receiver one. Uh, Macklin is probably the name that sticks out to me the most. Yeah. Like you said, he's pretty much, I mean, he's not guaranteed. Nothing is guaranteed in fantasy football, but he's the safest pick amongst that group because he is a proven commodity to put up basically wide receiver one numbers at his floor or wide receiver one high wide receiver two numbers mm-hmm. like you said the 12 to 15 range and he's basically the only show in town when it comes to the kansas city passing game yeah so you know he will be heavily targeted now the knock on macklin has always been that alex smith has basically a noodle arm and he won't throw the ball more than five yards mm-hmm. but that was essentially disproven with macklin's production last year he was completely solid and a viable wide receiver one yeah no i'm with you we seem to be on the same page about this um so i guess let's wrap this up Um, yeah let's wrap it up uh are there any teams that you specifically like looking at the board um i mean computer did a really good job uh computer killed it so watch out for computer when you're drafting your team (laughs) keep an eye out for computer because whoo it's tough because no i think is probably the answer (laughs) if there's any because i actually uh he took the guy in the third spot. I like the Peterson Alshon Cook start, but then you know Dion in the fourth. That's a reach for me in standard scoring. And then Brady in the sixth is just the most absurd thing I've ever seen in my entire life. Like it's <laughs> you know it's it's rare in these mock drafts. I see another team where I'm like, ooh, that guy really really killed it. Uh, what's it? Engine. Uh, even though he started Zeke, which I think is like insane. After that, if you kind of ignore Zeke, I guess it's not terrible. Lacey, yeah, Demarius, he took my stuff like on that. Diggs. Yeah, Diggs, uh, CJA, which there's some bounce back opportunity there for Edelman Park. Like after that, it gets like he has a pretty good team, except for Andy Dalton. I don't know what he's thinking. That's insane. Yeah, um, and so, if you're looking you know, at contrast, the closest thing to a zero running back would be the, the second slot, which was by that pesky computer again. Man, yeah, how did he get so many spots in this mock so draft? So many. Yeah, he's just on all these I different don't know. machines, just like. Oh, that's ridiculous. Yeah, that's it, completely yeah. unfair. That is pretty No, close. but he started uh, Brown, Evans, and Keenan, mm-hmm. which is fantastic. I mean, comp- computer aside, that's a good start. Yeah. But then you look at his first running back, and it's Jeremy Langford, and, and you want to throw up. And then he takes a tight end in the fifth, and it just gets worse and worse and worse. So you're looking at his top two running backs as Langford and Abdullah. And there's just question mark, question mark, question mark all, all over both of those players. Mm-hmm. His next in line is Crow. Again, yuck. I mean, Crow, Crow could surprise, let's be honest. But to be slotted in as one of your starting running backs or potential starting running backs, it's not really promising there. Yeah. And, yeah, there's not much else to say about this draft, really. No, I mean, we will probably... Uh revisit all these strategies again you know we'll kind of do a circuit like we'll hit some pbr and two quarterback and then at some point preseason we'll come back. Is long. yeah preseason yeah. long so we'll come back and do zero rb and robust rb again as we get closer to the start of the season and see how adp has changed it probably not in such a way that all of a sudden they are the messiah but you know it's worth to revisit closer because if you're sitting here at the end of august getting ready to draft and the last thing we've done for these strategies is from august 10th you're going to be like this is useless so exactly yeah we'll, we'll adps will change these. yeah all right well that's it for this episode of it's mock season uh i want to give a thanks to all of our new followers on twitter and mm-hmm. everyone who is liking and commenting on our youtube videos yes. you guys are the best you the thank best. you uh you subscribe like comment share all those buzzwords uh do uh, all of those things I'll do all those things uh, a thank you to bleacher breaker uh our partners who are going to start pumping us on their site so that's cool beans yeah um yeah and keep a uh, keep on watching and we'll keep bringing out the content sounds good that's it yeah. just cut it cut it i'm just gonna it. i'm gonna hit stop hit stop oh, okay